Hello friends, welcome to another episode of Bio News, and happy Monday. Today I have three papers to tell you guys about, beginning with a paper uh, by Lawson et al. This paper is a review paper, positing the idea that a drug called uh, flupertine may be an effective treatment for fibromyalgia. For those that don't know, fibromyalgia is a uh, horrifying uh, nervous condition in which people feel pain from both non-painful stimuli as well as feel excess pain from painful stimuli, what they call hyperalgesia. So unfortunately, fibromyalgia is not easily treated. At the moment, the current treatment methods use modulation of noradrenaline, modulation of serotonin, and modulation of calcium channels, all of which have um, barely better than placebo results in controlling pain among people with fibromyalgia. Now, for those that don't know, a theory for how fibromyalgia occurs in people is long periods of excess stressful stimuli. It seems that long periods of excess sti painful stimuli may cause alterations, for example, to the HPA axis, that's the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal stress axis. They may cause alterations to the autom autonomic nervous system, to the cardiovascular system, and uh, causing in the long term neuronal overexcitability, which means excess nervous signaling in the nervous system. This excess nervous signaling seems to cause this sensation of pain that they have in fibromyalgia. Now about the medication flupertine. Flupertine was first synthesized in Germany in the 1980s. What's interesting about this medication, it has two methods of action, one primary and one secondary. The primary one is it is a neuronal specific potassium channel opener. But consequent to that effect, it inhibits NMD glutamate receptor activity a little bit, which is the target, by the way, of ketamine, PCP, and the uh, anti-Alzheimer's disease medication, memantine. It also has a second effect, which is it's a direct GABA A receptor agonist. And interestingly, it, like benzos are not agonists of the GABA A receptors, for you guys to know. Benzos are GABA A receptor modulators. Agonists include um, the medications that put people to sleep before surgeries and things like that. So this flupertine is actually a, a light GABA A agonist, and it's selective of the GABA A receptors that contain delta units that are the targets of neurosteroids like allopregnanolone, whereas the benzos target other. Uh, they don't selectively target delta subunits. Um, some notes about the medication also, since it is an interesting medication. It does not produce an anti-inflammatory response uh, in the body, meaning it does not affect like tumor necrosis factor alpha or IL-6 or, or anything like that. It's not anti-pyretic, meaning it doesn't affect uh, people's temperature. It compares, compares favorably to NSAIDs in controlled trials, and it is slightly, unfortunately, hepatotoxic. 100 milligrams taken twice a day compares favorably with, uh, for example, ibuprofen. And there are studies using up to 300 milligrams four times daily. Now, I thought this was an interesting paper to review with you guys, not because many of you maybe have uh, uh, fibromyalgia, which unfortunately my mother has, so this is a little close to home. But moreover, this idea of neuronal uh, overexcitement is an important concept to understand for people that have other conditions, like, for example, people like myself who are diagnosed with ADHD. I believe that a lot of ADHD comes from too much neuronal excitement in people. And so sometimes psychiatrists call this the anxiety phenotype of ADHD, where, where their brains are too active that it becomes difficult to pay attention, not because there's too little paying attention hormones like dopamine and adrenaline and so on. Anyway, moving on to the next paper by Noguera et al. This paper was an in vivo rodent study trying to learn whether IV self-administration of cocaine affected the rodent's uh, opioid receptors. What they found was that uh, when rodents self-injected uh, cocaine, the availability, so mu opioid receptor gene expression in their nervous system increased and the functionality of the hippocampus's opioid receptors increase. What this indicates, number one, is that opioid receptors may play a role in the pleasure sense from cocaine, which is fascinating, because cocaine's effect should really be limited to the dopamine uh, transporter. And really, if you think of it that way, well, buterin maybe then may have some opioid-like effects. Moreover, this also indicates that someone quitting cocaine may have hyperalgesia, excess painful uh, sensations after they quit cocaine, despite it not being a, uh, an opioid. Finally, a paper by you et al. This paper is fascinating, so I don't know if you guys know about this, but there are a couple of methods of using electric waves 
to uh, treat depression and anxiety and uh, psychiatric conditions also in people. The goal of this actually, or the theory of how it works is that a couple of things happen. Number one, these electric shock therapy, for example, in this case, we're talking about electroconvulsive therapy. There's also other kinds of this transcranial magnetic stimulation, this transcranial electric stimulation. In all cases, even the magnetic one, what they're trying to do is cause neurogenesis using a um, using basically a slightly harmful stimuli which causes the body to respond in a net positive manner. This is called a hormetic stress. The interesting thing though is that sometimes electroconvulsive therapy will cause cognitive deficits afterwards because it is damaging in the first place. Now, so in this study, what they tried to find out was whether the cannabinoid system is involved in the deficits that sometimes occur with electroconvulsive therapy. What they found out was that it was, indeed. The authors found that blocking cannabinoid 1 receptors in the rodents attenuated the amount of cognitive deficits that they experienced, meaning blocking the cannabinoid 1 receptor before giving the rodents electroconvulsive uh, therapy limited the amount that the electroconvulsive therapy could damage the rodents' brains in a visible manner afterwards. And this seems to imply that the cannabinoid 1 receptors in the hippocampus at least are involved in a kind of overexcitability that comes consequent to molecular action that causes cell death, causing those deficits, which would explain also, of course, why uh, marijuana smokers frequently experience uh, memory issues, short-term memory issues, and hippocampal neurotoxicity is found across studies of THC. Thank you so much, guys, for bearing with me. I'll see you next time with another episode of BioNews.